This is this is all in the radio Mokchung at 100.9 megahertz on FM band. And on board the program, police and the citizens empowering in unison for a telephonic discussion. Today we have Sri Rubin Sharma, IPS, Director General, Border Affairs, Nagalan Police. Sir, I hope you're doing good today. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I'm doing well. All right, sir. You have both MBA and LLB degree, but yet you became an IPS officer. Was it by choice or out of compulsion? No, there was no compulsion. Uh, when mm -hmm. I was in college and I used to consult one of my lecturers for some sessions in zoology and I saw some books on civil services lying in his room. I just asked him, I said, what are these for? He said, this is for civil services. Despite my father being a civil servant, I had no idea what an IAS or a civil service is, like most kids. So when I asked him, he said, it's very difficult. But when I looked at the books, I found that I could answer a lot of questions. And I said, like, sir, I can answer these questions. So he said, you must be joking. It is a very difficult job. People have been appearing for four or five attempts and not been able to do it. Mm -hmm. So after I completed my MBA, that sort of became a challenge for me that so I tried and I got through into the civil services. Thank you so much for letting us know that. Now join with me here is Mr. Sinti Walling and he will also be a part of this discussion. Sinti, do you have anything in your mind to have a query from our uh, DG sir here? Yeah, sir, like how was it like then when you first landed up in Nagaland? I'm uh, virtually a thoroughbred Himachali. Uh, so there was not too much common between the two places. I had hardly ever ventured out of Nagaland uh, one or two or three trips uh, to Delhi. That one had never traveled uh, outside Himachal uh, except for the basic training in Hyderabad. So, firstly, when you come to know that you've got Nagaland as a card, and it is a shock and you have to look at it in the map. Fortunately for me, that was not a problem because I had been very good in general studies uh, throughout my college and university. And let me be honest, being so away from right. your home, nobody would be probably happy getting a card like that. So, I landed up uh, after a bit of uh, struggles in court. Uh, once I landed up, I found Nagaland was very different. Uh, I, one of my first experiences was that I thought like everybody is so uh, healthy that everybody has uh, uh, red cheeks and red uh, lips. <laughs> it was only in the next five days I had found out that it is because of Tamul <laughs> and not because of health moving around. It was uh, very different and diff difficult because Himachal Pradesh, which is one of the best governed states in the country, Law and order is not an issue. Here, like about three years ago, I was in uh, my hometown, which is Dharamsala. And my mother was mentioning about, she said like, oh, that chief engineer is very corrupt. And I said, oh, okay, he's corrupt. And what has happened? And she says he's taken a bribe of 50,000 rupees. Mm -hmm. So this is 2017 that she says that the chief engineer has taken a bribe of 50,000 rupees. And I was like scratching my head and looking at, oh, Himachal is still so honest that 50,000 is a big bribe. <laughs> <laughs> Things that different like I'm from a place which is relatively better managed better governed more honest more educated people more law-abiding people whereas Nagaland uh, it has been in a phase of transition for the past 75 years since independence there are problems because of that people have not I mean have not known the the arm of law arm not only the law as such but the arms of law how they function so it is difficult it is very different from the rest of the country things are catching up but uh, there are issues in the society. Uh, I'm not saying issues in the sense there is negative, but every society takes time to develop. Mm -hmm. So Nagaland, Nagas as a society will take time to develop and adjust to the modern ways of governance. So yes, things are different. It has been a difficult journey. Thank you so much for all the experiences that we have sh shared with people to listen and to watch. Uh, but you've been here for about uh, nearly three decades, let's say. And, uh, yeah, almost two and a half decades. Yeah, two and a half decades to be precise. And I feel that uh, you are one right person to be, uh, you know, observing as well as commanding on what has changed over this two and a half decades. So what yeah. are the experiences that you'd like to share? Sir? Uh, firstly, that a certain amount of development has taken place. 
uh, infrastructure development and all certain developments have taken place which is not necessarily powered by the uh, by the government a lot of development which takes place in any society is also because it is powered naturally by what is happening in the environment along, uh, around us you know uh, for example the telecom sector or the packaged goods or the mobile so the means whether without the government this will happen but i think a lot of things have happened without without the government without even an interface of the government in nagaland but yes the state government and the uh, government machinery has done an admirable job infrastructure has developed a bit so there is a, is a lot to be desired still people have become uh, more educated there is a larger number of people whom you can interact and talk with uh, in nagaland there is probably a greater degree of acceptability of mainlanders in nagaland besides the violence which has come down i personally feel there is not too much change in the law and order scenario from what existed in say 95 yes the levels of violence have come down the amount of clashes between the security forces and uh, the insurgents have come down because of the ceasefire and all but otherwise uh, uh, law and order probably remains the same the policing f- uh, functions and the the criminal justice system functions in nagaland have not become established uh it's it's sort of uh sad why this is uh not happened there are various factors one is society in transition which is the biggest factor because people would still want to go to their own village communities or the ngos or those uh, organizations to sort out disputes which would otherwise which which should otherwise come to the police or the judiciary then the other factor is the existence of underground uh, group who do wield uh, some degree of influence the formal criminal justice system as in policing and the judiciary is time consuming although it is the correct method but it is time consuming but if people want uh, quick justice uh, people are tempted to go towards underground organizations for quick dispensation of justice but we must realize that even though that justice is dispensed it is not on equal terms it is through the uh, barrel of the gun if you would say it it is through a threat and coercion rather than through a willing willing compliance to the uh, uh, authorities uh, uh in in the health and the infrastructure sector i would not say things have not improved but things are still far behind uh, uh, what should have been achieved uh, remoteness and uh, remoteness uh, is a factor but i think our delivery mechanisms uh, uh, leave a lot uh, to be desired the over tolerant attitude of uh, nagas that chalta hai attitude that if something has gone wrong even if it is deliberate we will tolerate it and maaf kare debo ho to na so that 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 has impacted uh, the development adversely over tolerant attitude with uh, uh law and order issues and uh, say crim- criminal issues being addressed at the community level rather than in a legal manner has also impacted the pace of development in the society because that fear of law is not there the fear is of uh someone pointing out a finger and then you reconciling and making friends or bargaining with him and settling issues rather than the fear of punishment if you do something wrong so things have been changing but things have been changing very slowly um, there is a substantial number of people who are educated now who have been raising issues like corruption and whatever back to appointments and arbitrary use of authority and all earlier say when i came most of these issues were not raised uh i think um, uh, factors like social media have also made an impact because now people get uh, the same information is shared within no time to almost all segments of the uh, society in nagaland also so things have changed i think the pace at which things will change will become faster and faster in the coming days because of the technological factors and also the literacy uh i think another big uh, contributory factor for change could be 
the youngsters of Nagaland uh, who have been educated outside Nagaland. They come and see good things, better things, better governed systems, better systems in the rest, rest of the country. They want to come back and discuss and implement those things. So they will bring about a greater change, a greater chance of discussion on various issues. So things will change. I'm very hopeful that things will change, although it will take some time, but things will change. Thank you for your hope. Also, thank you so much for being outrageously bold and honest in giving your opinion. So like as discussed earlier, Nagaland has to change. And compared to other states, Nagaland is still lagging behind. Yes. So definitely yes. change will take place. Change is coming. But what should the society's first step be in order to bring changes in Nagaland? There are certain things which uh, can be changed through the intervention of the government and the society. Certain things which will change on their own. Uh, certain things which will have a mix of both, but with a certain degree of uh, some degree of government intervention, they could be made to go in a certain direction, in a des desirable direction. Uh, for example, the transition of Nagas from a traditionally village-oriented, tribal-oriented society to a modern, codified law-abiding society, it is desirable. Now, there is hardly any effort being made in that direction. There is more effort towards reconciliation of various disputes and matters. Even government and governance issues, things are decided informally between parties. Now, when things are decided informally between parties, it weakens the formal system of governance because the government is not in the thick of things. So, I think that the government systems need to become more vibrant. They need to become more assertive. I am not saying that the NGOs and the unions do not have a role, but I think the primary role is of the government. Well, this clash happened in the Kivungan area. These are instances which happen very frequently in Nagaland. Inter-village clashes, inter-tribal clashes. I'm not saying very frequently, but yes, they do happen. And we leave it up to the villages to sort it out. We leave it up to the communities to sort it out. Yes, the government does intervene. But the government intervenes we are sort of neck deep in water. Uh, I, I think if the government machinery, for example, can intervene in the lull period, you know, we all know that all these clashes normally start, uh, say, say, November to February, they last, most of them. But this period of, say, uh, February, uh, from, say, March to October is the period when they could be sorted out. And I'm not saying this with a view to criticize anyone. So I, I, I think this is where we leave things too much to the communities. Yes, the communities have a role to play, but, but the government machinery has a role to play. Um, I would probably be surprised if most of these and the DCs, again, I'm not criticizing an individual. I'm just saying how the system would function in another place. In all other Parts of the country, probably the SPs and the DCs would make a list of uh, potential flashpoints in their areas, whether it is on the basis of tribe or village clashes or even between two families or individuals. It can very well be possible that there are two families who are not at good terms and they will fight. So they'll make a list of all those flashpoints and they will try to address all those flashpoints well in time. Ours is more of a reactive measure. We react when things start going out of hand. We don't engage with people. Now, I'm not saying individuals don't engage with people. Yes, officers do engage, but the officers and the people who do engage, they don't leave it for uh, their successors so that it's sort of the handing over of the baton in a relay race. It's not that Nagaland has not been doing well. Nagaland has been doing well within its constraints, but there are better... Uh, better governed systems, better systems in place in the rest of the country where dispute resolution is done through the intervention of the government machinery. I think we need to look at those, middle, uh, those models and learn and adopt. And in today's world, when the government has so much to offer for the villages and the communities and the individuals, whether it is by way of uh, development projects or uh, Manrega schemes or uh, jobs or contracts 
I think government is, government does wield a lot of influence where government can, can influence the outcome of various uh, decisions and disputes in the villages or in the countryside. Uh, many people are of the opinion that the law and order situation in Nagaland will be better off once the Naga issues are solved. So how do you take on this? Uh, see, there are certain things which uh, uh, which get impacted by the law and order, uh, by the uh, insurgency or by the flux in the situation directly. Okay. Uh, a lot of other things don't get affected by insurgency. Uh, what I can broadly list out what gets directly affected by insurgency uh, in Nagaland. Uh, firstly, the extortion by undergrounds. If there is an accord, that there is a likelihood of that coming down. I am not saying that will come down. I am just saying likelihood of that coming down. Uh, then the use and abuse of weapons and arms to threaten people, uh, whether to settle uh, individual disputes or conflicts or for extortion, that will come down. Then the possibility of arms being trafficked and sold will come down. Uh, these are the things which will probably directly change if an accord uh, takes place. Uh, besides that, an accord could have a uh, trickle-down effect on certain other things, uh, which could be corruption. Uh, I know for sure and I have heard a lot of people saying that if there is an accord, the amount of corruption will get controlled because now there is... Uh, there is uh, a widespread opinion that uh, some amount of uh, corrupt money also lands up in the hands of the undergrounds. Even if it does not uh, land in the hands of the undergrounds, uh, there is this uh, oft-repeated uh, uh, alibi by certain people that they have to indulge in corrupt practices because of threats and pressures from undergrounds. So hopefully, if there is an accord and there is a peaceful solution, hopefully that, uh, that amount of corruption may come down, especially if there is a direct involvement of undergrounds there. However, if that is just an excuse by the not so honest people to put the blame on undergrounds, then I don't think there will be a change in the uh, patterns of corruption or the levels of corruption uh, post an accord. Uh, post accord, if the police is able to assert itself, uh, the trust of public in police is, is likely to go up. And people may, uh, and the police may get uh, more reports of crime. That can happen. But personally, I feel that uh, that trust has to be earned by the police. Uh, it will not come out. It will not come just by signing an accord. Police will have to take uh, proactive steps to uh, win back the trust of the people as the sole guardians of law and law and order in the society. Um, post an accord, uh, there could also be uh, there could also be dissatisfaction among certain elements who are currently associated with various uh, political groups uh, who may not uh, find rehabilitation in the manner in which they think uh, they uh, should be getting. So that could be a reason for discord. Uh, I, I I think besides uh, besides this, uh, another issue which uh, impacts law and order and development in the society is uh, uh, 
the proliferation of NGOs in the society in Nagaland, the number of NGOs and associations and groups, not, uh, not underground related, but uh, various society groups, uh, a lot of uh, social media activists have written against them. Uh, from, from the development perspective and from the perspective of uh, um, uh, sort of creating holes in the pockets of uh, an ordinary civilian, an ordinary man, those NGOs and societies and associations are an equal culprit, if not a bigger culprit than the extortion or the taxation by the undergrounds. Because I presume that an ordinary man in Nagaland has to pay uh, membership fees forcibly to many organizations in the, right, uh, in the society. Yeah, so uh, that is something which has to be tackled with or without an accord. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, how an accord will stand out is uh, slightly difficult to say, but let us hope that things will. Uh, become um, well the society will become more and more free of threat and coercion that is the hope uh, but with or without that accord coming i think there is no substitute to better law and order i think uh, as i said that uh, the police and this uh, the police has to understand that it is it is the sole guardian of uh, uh, safety and security of individuals in the society uh, and uh, I think police uh, in Nagaland should uh, take pride in this duty and I think we should probably try to assert my, as ourselves much more uh, because if we, if we sort of uh, get into the habit of not doing it, then it will take us a long time to start doing it again uh, when it is required. So I, I think the Nagaland police, uh, I mean, I, I'm not saying that it has not been doing it, but I think the Nagaland police is also an institution which uh, uh, has to start uh, thinking of more proactiveness in policing matters. So during our discussion, I just felt that you've been a little skeptical regarding the role of police here in Nagaland. And with those kind of skepticism, do you feel that a post-accord scenario here in Nagaland will be peaceful? I am not skeptical about the role of the police and I don't even underestimate the role of uh, what Nagaland police has been doing. Uh, see, uh, 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 and it is not, not any commentary on any individual or the government or anyone, no. It, 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 is this, it is the stage of development of policing in Nagaland which is, uh, which is behind schedule, okay? It is that stage of development of policing in Nagaland, which is about say 20 years behind schedule in, uh, uh, as compared to the rest of the country. There are systems in policing in Nagaland which are not, uh, which, are, which, which need to be improved. For example, I'll tell you like, uh, I mean, this is not, I'm not putting faults in anyone. I am a part of the same system. But we have to learn from other states and do it uh, uh, and make a better system. You know, uh, in Nagaland, whenever there is any uh, big instance uh, which uh, takes place, there is this tendency to form an SIT. Okay, I have myself been uh, uh, heading, I have myself headed two, three SITs in the past. But most of these SITs uh, uh, have been found wanting in the final uh, results. The, the reason for that is that the SITs are, are made by picking people from various uh, districts or officers from various places. It is not a composite comprehensive unit which functions 24 7. Okay, now in okay. other states, for, for example, just give you an example. In other states, the state CIDs, CIDs is not intelligence, CIDs is criminal investigation department. Okay, it is a state level unit, sometimes headed by a DG or an ADG in most of the states. It has a formal system of, a, of an IG or a DIG and three, four SPs and DYSPs and inspectors. It is a full fledged unit which functions 24 seven. Any important case happening in the entire state, 
the first option is not an SIT, but to give it to the state CID. Because it is a fully functional body. In, in, in for example, in Nagaland, yes, there is a DIG CID. There is an IG crime and a DIG CID. But be, uh, below them, there are just hardly a, a handful of officers. So those handful of officers, we cannot expect them to deliver results uh, on their own. You know, the staff, staffing and manpower is uh, not adequate there. So, so we we have known systems. We we know systems in other states where what is a CID and what is its role and how it should function. But those systems have not been brought. To Nagaland and made functional the way the manner in which they should be. So I am not skeptical about the individual capabilities of officers. Right. Given an opportunity, they would probably do a very good job. But sometimes an individual will only be as good as the system in which into which he is put. So. so while we need to invest in developing individuals and officers by training and retraining and giving them exposure, sending them abroad, whatever, outside Nagaland or whatever, there is also a requirement to strengthen the systems. Without a system, without a backup for an individual, you cannot do anything. We cannot do anything. It is not about me. It is about everybody. You know, so I am not skeptical about the Nagaland police. No. There are systems, there, there, there are institutions in Nagaland police which need to be created, uh, equipped, and strengthened. You know, for example, we uh, honestly, I'll give you an example again, no, no comment on an individual. Uh, but for example, we have the post of what uh, the SP border. Okay. There is very little defined role for the SP border. There is very little mechanism for the SP border. There is very little uh, reporting mechanism which is defined for the SP border. That I, I, I'm not saying anything against the individual or I'm not even commenting on the government policy. What I'm just saying is when we create a post, we need to strengthen the mechanism which will help it to function. Without a mechanism, a supporting mechanism, an institution to uh, to make an officer or institution function, it will not help. So we 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 need to learn from better systems which exist in other states and uh, do things. I mean, another another example I'll give you is like many years ago. This was I think. Uh, 18, 20 years ago, when there was an uh, emphasis on human rights, when human rights first were brought into the focus uh, in the country, the MHA and the government of India uh, and probably even the National Human Rights Shabana. Commission, they recommended that that because of custodial deaths, there should be a post of a DIG or a IG human rights and social justice. Now, Nagaland also, we did create a post of human rights and social justice. The gentleman, whoever gets posted there has no work. Okay. You know, so I mean, uh, rather than having having a post where there is no work, we could have uh, this. See, we will have 100 people out of which say some will have work, some will not have work. But if the 100 posts, and they can be a club where everybody gets some work to do, then the systems become stronger. So uh, this my skeptic. I am not skeptical about the the the, uh, the quality of Nagaland police. Our boys are the best. And again, I am not flattering anyone. I have worked with all of them. They are the best. They need to have systems which support them. Which need to have systems which encourage them to work. We need to have systems where they have uh, targets to achieve. Uh, we need to have systems where their performance can be measured. And similarly, the systems of rewards and punishment, if they do something good or they are not able to achieve certain things. 
So these these are these are things which we need to focus on rather than uh, I mean uh, pointing out fingers. I, I I would not want to I I don't want to point out fingers. It's like improvement of systems. There are systems that there, there are things on paper. Right. Sir. We don't need hmm. to we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Right. So wheel is already there. We just have to make that wheel go around in circles for us to travel that distance. Right, sir. Like as 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 stated by you, Nagaland Police have been the performance of Nagaland Police, the duties performed by Nagaland Police have been loaded by you know like all the states of India. Who, no matter where they go, they have yeah. been praised for their uh, duties. Now, yes, yes. That aside, now mm. with the with the advent of technology, with the advancement. How prepared, or what is the capacity of Nagaland Police in in investigating, and especially in the modern day crime, sir? Uh, I think uh, see, um, uh, uh, see the the again there can be no one single parameter which can be used. Okay. Uh, for uh, knowing the qualities of uh, or capabilities of Nagaland Police, uh, uh, but uh, two three different things on which you can assess, we can try to assess Nagaland Police uh, is uh, one is uh, in the work of uh, prevention and detection of crime. Uh, I think our uh, our our capabilities, manpower as well as. Uh, 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 manpower capabilities as well as our infrastructure uh, in uh, prevention and detection of crime uh, leaves a lot to be desired our detection of crimes is is quite low and please uh, uh, let me clarify that by detection i am not saying investigation uh, detection of cases which are registered i am saying detection of crime which are not registered means which okay. means first i detect a crime and then i register it okay. you know so some some man, let me make things clear like if if a person x is having a weapon 0.32 uh, revolver at his home okay and if yeah. i go and search for it based on my information that is a, that is what i will call detection okay but if there is a, there is a weapon which is found with a criminal but the criminal is not found mm -hmm. but i know that he he had it in his home and i search for that crime that is investigation that is slightly different right so detection is when he takes that initiative and finds out about a crime right investigation is there is a crime which is registered and by try to find out who has committed it Mm -hmm. So our capabilities in investigation and um, in detection and prevention are low because our systems are not uh, very good. Our uh, infrastructure for um, uh, investigation of modern crimes uh, like uh, cyber crimes and all uh, is just about okay. Say on a scale of uh, zero to hundred, where zero is minimal to hundred, it will be around forty-five, fifty, which is not bad for a right, state so. like Nagaland. Uh, our manpower, manpower capabilities in uh, detection of crimes, uh, uh, sophisticated crimes, including uh, IT crimes and all, would again be say on a scale of zero to hundred would be around uh, thirty, okay. uh, which is not good, which needs a lot to be desired. Because see, I am saying thirty because a large chunk of the police force does not uh, know uh, do that investigation job also. Okay. Okay. So uh, one is the number of people who can do it, and secondly, the capability of the people who can do it. So both ways, it is like uh, not uh, very good. Uh, then uh, we will come to investigation of crimes. Uh, there are certain crimes which we don't follow up on. For example, extortion, underground uh, uh, extortion by undergrounds or by uh, civilians. Conspiracies uh, and corruption is another area where uh, we don't focus on. Um, I think overall you can say around say, 
say 35 to 40 on a scale of 100 should be good enough uh, as of today for Nagaland Police. So there is a lot of scope for improvement. I think that will happen with training and with exposure. Uh, and it will, exposure is not only exposure outside the state, but also exposure by way of investigating more crimes. So as I said, that the crime figures for the past 20 years have not increased too much despite the population having grown two times. Now, if I'm, if I'm investigating 100 cases today with five officers, my exposure will only be around 20 cases per officer. But if, my, if the number of cases registered is 200, then each of my officers investigates double the number of cases, right. hypothetically. So that exposure, that quantity of exposure and that quality of exposure will also him, help us in improving our skills. Okay. But since we are registering less number of cases or lesser number of people are coming to us with their complaints, it is taking us more time to improve our skills. So is it the trust issue or the ignorance of the people? It's both. It is both. Ignorance of people, ignorance, ignorance of people is a factor where they don't know what is the law. Uh, okay, it is trust factor. People don't want to come to police for various reasons, including lack of trust on police or because of the tribal loyalties where they don't trust whether the information which they are giving to the police will be kept secret or will be handled in the manner in which it, it should be handled without any uh, officer taking sides in an investigation. Right, sir. So prejudice is another factor. Then uh, over-reliance on um, alternate dispute resolution mechanism, which is either the unions or the associations or the undergrounds or the village councils. That is another factor which uh, uh, prevents people from coming to the police. Okay. And ignorance of law is a major issue where mm -hmm. people don't know whether uh, what they are doing is a crime. You know? Uh, uh, corruption is a typical uh, matter in which uh, people will say, oh, Amit, you know, you know, you know, you know. For example, any, any, any policeman in the street, I, I was reading this uh, interview by Commissioner of Police, Rothio, I think two days back, where he said that they have to fine and whatever they find that money has to be deposited in the government treasury or something, you know. Uh, People, not this is not only police, like any money which a government servant imposes by way of a fine, which is authorized to do it, that money has to be deposited in the government treasury. Okay. Now, mostly our own officers don't know it also. I'm not saying police. Our officers don't know it also. And the public also doesn't know it. So what happens is that a fine of 500 rupees, he charges 100 rupees and puts it in his own pocket rather than ch charging 500 rupees and putting it in the government deposits. So the public sort of benefits because sort of they are paying a bribe of getting away by paying 100 rupees where they should have been paying 500 rupees. Right. This person puts the 100 rupees in his pocket. Mm -hmm. He doesn't show it to anyone. but the ultimate loser in this game is because of all this ignorance. Like they will simply say, "Ah, me too. Na jane to iniga koru bola si." Na ino iniga koru bola gaya me na jane to. This is the oft repeated uh, excuse in Nagaland. Mm -hmm. He may know it, but he will simply say, "Ah, me too. Na jane to iniga koru bola tha." <laughs> okay, but the ultimate loss of all this is the government and the development process. If the same amount of money which is collected through fines is to go into the government treasury, the budget of Nagaland government will increase. The revenue collection of Nagaland government will increase. Okay, And Nagaland, as you know, is a state where most of our schemes are on a 90-10 funding basis. We go with 10% of the money to the government of India. Government of India gives 90% of the funding to us. Which means that if today I am collecting only 500 rupees as a revenue, I will only get, get 4,500 rupees as assistance from government of India. But if 
uh, if my collection goes up to 10000 rupees i will get 90000 more right so ultimately in this whole process the development suffers especially in case of nagaland because we are dependent on what we raise the less the amount of money that we raise into the government coffers or we show into the government coffers the more is the loss to the ordinary person so it is it is ignorance it is alternate dispute resolution mechanism it is lack of trust lack of faith uh, i think that tribal mindset has a lot to do with this uh, the the uh, the sort of distrust among people that if i go to a particular police station whether my secrecy or the secrecy of my information will be maintained whether the investigation will be partial or not those are major factors in nagaland uh and it is just about time that the the inter tribal integration of tribes in nagaland is driven driven by is driven formally by the government mm-hmm. you know i i remember i was in uh, many years uh, i was in uh, united peacekeeping mission in united nations peacekeeping mission in bosnia we had three four officers from nagaland cartman nagaland there i was there joseph heso was there and then uh, susang was there um, vijay dangami was there. we were together in the same group you know what uh, in in bosnia the society was divided and they had undergone a war where three major sections of the society had fought with each other it is the muslims which are called the bosniaks the croats which were croats were essentially catholic christians and uh, the serbs who were orthodox christians so they irrespective of the religion they they had fought with each other uh, and you know what was the job of the united nation peacekeepers our job was to get the um, the bosnian police which means these three components the muslims the croats and the serbs to function in an integrated manner okay. so that they don't act with prejudice with any mem- member of the other community okay now okay. this is exactly we I mean, we had we were we were empowered to force it down the bosnian police officers we were we we had the power to tell them this is wrong you need to change this otherwise you can be thrown out of the job so nagaland is not di- not too different from that right. so this so so there is there is probably a requirement for uh see a, a, a forced integration to be driven by the government you know where uh, in all police stations no but all police stations especially in dimap in the in the bigger towns like in dimapur koima mokokchung the bigger towns in the urban areas where population composition of the staff posted in a police station should be based on tribal representation one and we should have mechanisms to ensure that the officers and the staff who are posted there they don't discriminate against each other on the basis of religion or on the basis of tribe right right you know well, it will it 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 will see it will help will bring in a degree of naganess into the society rather than an angami and an au and a kemokan ness into the society you know so it will help true all right sir we really appreciate you speaking out your mind and that's a great take for all the listeners of all india radio mukchung and listeners on the program police and the citizens empowering in unison we have just had a telephonic discussion with our respected director general border affairs shri rubin sharma ips nagaland police thank you sir thank you so much for your time thank you very much